Hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it is uh, Friday, February 26th. This is Michael Bracey joining you uh, with today's edition of Music Policy Forum Live, our weekly conversation show where we talk about all sorts of issues at the intersection of music, public policy, philanthropy, the nonprofit sector, uh, all the sort of components of what make up music ecosystems and what people are doing to engage in the work and try to make uh, better, more resilient, more equitable uh, and thriving music communities uh, locally, uh, regionally, nationally, globally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as always, we are so appreciative of you spending some of your Friday with us. We know you're extraordinarily busy and uh, we hope that you will find this a, a good use of your, of your day. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we jump into our programming. Um, for those of you who are new to uh, our show, welcome. Uh, we really appreciate that you are, are joining us. Um, nobody should feel obligated to do so, but if you're so inclined, uh, why don't you put your name and your location uh, where you join us from in the chat. It's always fun to get a sense of the range of, of our audience members and um, all the folks who are joining us from all over the world. Uh, again, it's, it's super great that you are, are with us. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, for our panel um, throughout the uh, session today. Um, those could be uh, done in the Q&A function. Um, you can raise your hand. Uh, potentially, we'll, we'll see if we can kind of integrate that into the, uh, into the programming today as well. Um, and then, you know, big picture stuff. Um, we always appreciate your comments, your feedback your suggestions, um, ge very generously and kindly worded constructive criticism. Uh, we always love to hear from you. We do this program because uh, you all in the audience really respond to it and ask us to keep doing it. So uh, always feel free to reach out to us at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Uh, and finally, our producer, Alex Dolben, who um, is really the reason this program works, it does such an amazing job uh, kind of keeping uh, everything moving. Uh, Alex will be putting uh, some relevant links and other information into the chat as we go throughout. So, you know, if you follow along the chat, um, there'll be some resources and articles and background materials that uh, you may find helpful. So every week we begin with a little bit of a news roundup and, and just kind of some uh, catch up on, on what's happening. Again, we took a break last week, so we haven't been with you for a couple of weeks. And for most of us watching this program uh, are watching obviously very carefully what's happening uh, here in Washington with the Small Business Administration and preparing to get the shuttered venue operator grants out the door. Uh, the administration made announcements this week about PPP loans and moving forward on those with priorities for the smallest of businesses. Uh, we're not gonna go into the weeds on those topics today, but I know we all feel the tension between uh, you know, the exhilaration of the uh, Saver Stages legislation passing, but then the frustration of getting out the door well, also, um, certainly from our standpoint, understanding that this is a really hard task that the SBA has been asked to deal with, and it's not easy to create and implement a $15 billion program and, and do it right and do it um, as quickly as possible. So a lot of different pieces there, but certainly we're hoping for some clarity in the next week or, or two. Uh, otherwise, I, I, for those of you, again, who follow this work are, are probably tracking pretty closely. Uh, Congress and the administration are moving forward with the next stage of relief legislation. Uh, it feels like that's going to pass probably on March 14th, March 13th, March 14th, which is the date that unemployment benefits sunset. So they'll probably take it all the way to the deadline uh, of unemployment benefits, but most likely get that through uh, right around then. Again, that's going to have significant impact for everybody. Uh, it's going to have a lot of money for state and local governments. It's going to have, uh, again, the un unemployment extensions and other things. So looking forward to that piece of legislation moving forward. Um, again, the work that we do at Music Policy Forum and the work that uh, we highlight in this weekly program um, really, again, as I said before, is, is rooted in a couple of ideas. One, obviously, is the notion of alignment and ecosystems and the fact that in the music community, there are, no matter what role we sit in, no matter where we work, there are things that we can do to work in alignment and in collaboration with partners, uh, whether in the public sector and in, in industry and in the philanthropic sector and the NGO sector. And, you know, the ongoing challenge for all of us is to understand what does that look like in practice and how do we think about that? And again, as I said before, how do we build better, stronger, more resilient, uh, more fair um, structures in our community, recognizing that the music community, even pre-COVID, uh, has uh, many, many kind of structural challenges in, inherent in, in the way that the industry works. The other, you know, kind of piece 
of this, which again, we've worked on, you know, as sort of the DNA of the Music Policy Forum and a lot of other organizations that, that think about, you know, how do we not just think about the incremental, but how do we think big? And how do we think about, are there some things that we're just missing or, or some things that um, with a fundamental reframing or realignment we could do at different at structural level? And I want to just call out a couple of things and Alex can put these in, in the chat. Um, I want to point out a, an article by a journalist named Liz Pelly. Uh, Liz is going to join us in, on the show in a couple of weeks to talk about the work that she's been doing, sort of documenting the, the um, sort of advances in the digital music industry. Um, but she's got a, a really provocative article that, that came out last week, um, sort of positing what would it look like for us to have a publicly owned streaming platform. So instead of relying simply on Spotify and Apple and, and the corporate side, is this something that could be supported through taxpayers and through the public sector, um, sort of a, you know, maybe through the library system. Again, it's a, I'm not endorsing it. I don't think any of us at Music Policy Forum say this is the path, like this is the way to go, but it's the kind of thinking that we really enjoy because it's, it's really helping us kind of challenge some assumptions and, and really think outside of our, of our, you know, kind of traditional boxes. Uh, related to that, I want to point out um, a Twitter thread, <laughs> Jesus. It's come to pointing out Twitter threads. Anyway, a Twitter thread through um, from my old colleague at Future Music Coalition, Kevin Erickson, put together today. Um, that's talking about how do we define the public interest in terms of music ecosystems, and how do we maybe get away thinking about the public interest as defined by what's good for consumers to thinking more broadly about what's good for all of us as people who live in this country and as human beings, and how does that potentially help shape the way we think about music policy and 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 things moving forward. I thought it was really, really well written, a very, just a, a really, again, thoughtful and provocative uh, way to kind of look at this stuff and think about it and frame it in, in our own mind. So I, I really wanted to point that out to y'all. Um, two more kind of shout outs before we, we move into our guests. Um, again, because, you know, it's incredibly important, you know, you know, we do this work with a great deal of humility. And, and again, what's fun and interesting about this work for us is that Nobody has all the answers. There's no five point plan to fix music. You know, we're all going through this together. And that's why the conversations like we're having today are so important to us. And it's really important, I think, to always be acknowledging that a lot of folks have been thinking about this in different configurations for a lot of years and a long time. And, and especially this notion of ecosystems and interconnectedness, uh, the interconnected nature of, of our work. And, and so one organization that I really wanted to shout out which I think is an organization that's been very meaningful for many of our guests that they may want to talk more about later, uh, is the Responsible Hospitality Institute, RHI, who have been doing a lot of work for decades, helping cities think about the interconnected nature again of nightlife and, 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 and the nightlife economy and businesses and industry and all sort of the issues related to the hospitality side and, and how to do that with intention and purpose, um, again, responsibly in, in, in their name. So I wanted to just, you know, kind of flag that a lot of the thinking I think that certainly has helped inform our music policy forum and the work on the music side is, is, is really been um, complemented and helped driven by organizations like RHI. And last, just a kind of a point of personal privilege, I guess, since I get to host the show, um, I want to flag that uh, somebody who's been a really, really important part of our community for a really long time and a, a great friend and ally um, and partner in our work uh, is is leaving his position. Uh, today is, is Mike Rickson's last day as Vice President for Policy and Rep Representation at NPR. Uh, he's been in that position, I think, for 18 years and um, is yeah, retiring and moving on to next adventures in his life. Um, Mike is one of those guys who we're just really fortunate to have in the community because he's really straddled the sort of idealistic sort of think big, think about like, what's the role of public media? How does music sort of evolving role in, in public radio change over the last couple of decades? What does that mean for policy? What does that mean for support of the broader network? Uh, and then how does that actually get played out in terms of on the ground advocacy and support for the public media infrastructure and for public radio? Now, in particular, Mike is a, one of the key drivers behind an organization that we've talked about previously on this program that we are just a huge uh, supporter of and believer of the Noncom Music Alliance, which again is the effort to pull together 140 some odd public radio stations across the country to really advance the conversation about what is the role of public radio in music and how do we advance it beyond just radio stations, but infrastructure and outreach and audience engagement and support for the local community and all the things that um, that a public radio station can do that, and, and increasingly are doing. And so Mike 
you know, it's one of the key visionaries behind creating the Noncom Music Alliance. And we just have so much appreciation for him and we're going to miss him. So there, that's that. We now um, are really psyched to move into um, today's topic. Again, for those of you who watch our show uh, on a regular basis know we typically have two topics. And today, uh, this is such a big, broad uh, conversation that we're just we're just focusing solely on this. And, and I'm really excited that we're doing this because um, the emergence and the sort of evolution and growth of however we're gonna define this sector, and I'm gonna be actually be curious to see how our guests think we should define the sector, but what we generally think about as the community of public officials that are responsible for helping navigate the complexities of the nighttime economy. And what does that mean, again, for workers? What does that mean for the music community? What does that mean for, for consumers and, and for audiences? All those related issues. This has really been a, a, an evolving um, community and sector that in, in the last, I would say, five to seven years has just really, really picked up. And um, today we're, we're going to do something that we're really, we like to do it in, in our program. We're going to hopscotch across the country and talk to a bunch of leaders uh, who are working with cities to get a sense of uh, how they're responding to some of these issues and topics, how they're structuring their work, uh, and, and, and some advice that they may give to those of us on, on this call today in this meeting today who might be thinking about this model for their own community, but like some kind of insight and guidance into, into what this all means. Uh, so before we begin, I, I need to um, acknowledge that Adrian Tonin from Detroit um, is not able to join us today. We're going to bring Adrian onto a program uh, down the road. Uh, I, I, uh, he, he sends his regrets and was really excited to be with us today. So, so we look forward to bringing Adrian back in for a conversation about Detroit. But I'm going to start now uh, with Scott Plusilik from the City of Seattle. And, and Scott has been um, a friend and ally of our work. He's been the co-director of the Seattle Revs Pilot Initiative and um, helped organize today's program. So Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for the shout out to RHI. I just really appreciate that. I think everybody on this call would acknowledge or all the panelists here would acknowledge that uh, we wouldn't be quite where we are today if it weren't for the work of Jim Peters and RHI. So uh, appreciate you highlighting them. Yeah, no, awesome. So Scott, let's just start, you know, kind of with a, a kind of basic introduction to your role in Seattle, kind of where it sits in, in city government and kind of how do you, what is your mission? Like what, what are you aiming to do with your particular role? Sure. Um, and, and I think um, you, you touched on the, the broad spectrum of, of this. I don't think you're going to get a, um, a, a, uh, similar re response from any single person uh, here. We all come from different backgrounds and we all sit in different places. So um, it's, it's really interesting how, um, how this is starting to evolve. Um, and it's very exciting, at least for me, to, to be in on the ground floor of an emerging, um, uh, an emerging sector. Um, uh, so it's fascinating to watch how it's happening across the globe. But, um, me personally, um, I am the nightlife business advocate for the city. I sit in the Office of Film and Music, which is a sort of a um, cohort of the Office of Economic Development. So my, um, my focus is very much on the economic development side of, of um, this sector. Um, I work primarily as a liaison for the nightlife uh, industry. And in, when I talk about the nightlife industry in that aspect, I'm talking primarily about the entertainment industry. I'm talking about our nightclubs, our live music venues, bars, taverns, you know, cabarets, things like that. Um, and work with them if they have any interaction with the city. Mm -hmm. um, and then another aspect of what I do though, is working on policies and programs that, um, that are meant to grow the nighttime economy and sector. And by that, I actually am talking more about, and I think a term that um, will be used by folks here is more life at night. Um, and that's the whole spectrum of the nighttime economy and our transportation networks and our, our late night workers and you know folks who are cleaning our offices downtown and the, the, the longshoremen and the, the Uber drivers and what have you. So, Really looking at that when you talk about ecosystems, um, for me, um, I really like to look at the two ecosystems and how the live music or the music um, ecosystem sits inside of the of the larger nighttime system. Um, so, so really trying to look at 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 
um, that broader spectrum as well, because everything that we do that supports the, the, the music sector ecosystem will by default help and support the, the greater nighttime economy and vice versa. So um, those are the main two focuses. So Scott, why don't you help me walk through this? Maybe you can help introduce our other guests as, as part of this question. So again, as I said at the beginning, part of what's fascinating about sort of the, the parallel tracks of the nightlife work in, inside cities and counties with the sort of music advocacy work is, is that everyone's kind of approaching it feels like a little bit differently. And I know our guests today each sort of have a little bit of a different approach in terms of where they sit in city government. And um, why don't you, why don't you help kind of you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of where to go first with this kind of geographically, but why don't we go with Joe first? Let's go with Iowa City. Um, yeah. Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Uh, so, yeah, like you were saying, there's a lot of differences between where we are positioned, um, our, where we're stationed with our job. Uh, I am positioned inside of a self-sustaining municipal improvement district, and it's called the Iowa City Downtown District. Um, we have just so many. Uh, it's a very dense a uh, couple of blocks of shops, of restaurants, of, of music venues. We have seven music, live music venues. Um, so there's just a lot of collateral there. And the, um, this role was created uh, about three years ago. And uh, where I think the common thread we're going to find here is liaisoning. Uh, definitely a lot more in this past year than any other year. Um, but specifically with my role, being as we're part of a district, it's an entertainment district, I'm here to cultivate, sustain, and promote arts and nightlife culture. So a lot of it is the operators and other sources, uh, connecting them to other people that we think they might be good partnerships with. Uh, one example I can think of is we have another live music venue coming this spring um, and I'm plugged them into uh, somebody who was programming a previous space in our downtown for live music uh, and that um, contract went away and so they have offered their help and I put those two people together and they're going to start working on shows coming this spring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that hits most of most of the points, but we'll get more into it as we go on in this interview. Yes, great. That's great. And and I'm gonna pull in Allison Harden now from from Pittsburgh, if if I don't mind, because Allison, you're coming at this primarily from kind of a public safety perspective. Is that right? Was that the entry point to kind of think about the the, the kind of framework of the position? It was the formation of the position, I would say, um, but the goal was always to have a balance of safety and economic development. So um, this role was created in about 2012 um, after following a, um, an assessment, a sociable city assessment by RHI, Responsible Hospitality Institute. And I used to work with RHI uh, for many years. Uh, got my start with them in 1996 in San Diego, where I was doing this work similarly. Didn't call this a nighttime economy manager or a nightmare back then, but um, it was similar work. But the, uh, so the uh, framework for Pittsburgh is really a sociable city umbrella under which, you know, food, beverage, entertainment falls. But I think it's an interesting approach because it kind of gets to your like, what's good for all of us tweet. You know, um, socializing and social connection is important for everybody's mental and emotional health. We know that no, now more than ever uh, as part of a pandemic. But um, our vision is to have, you know, safe and vibrant places for people to socialize of all ages, lifestyles and cultures so that nightlife is not just for 20 somethings, but it's really more the social aspect and the social assets, access. Um, and so my, the safety part of it, you know, I am a liaison to those businesses. I'm also a liaison to all the departments that touch on nighttime economy and um, also, you know, become a subject matter expert for our city council and mayor as they, you know, seek policies that relate to nighttime economy and, and um, entertainment as part of that. And I love that you, uh, use the, the term uh, nightmare. The um, first 
uh, to my, I, I could be wrong about this, but the first time many of us became familiar with the concept of a nighttime um, you know, manager or, or advocate uh, was when we brought Merrick over from Amsterdam. He was the first nighttime advocate for the city of Amsterdam and, and, and helped kind of uh, do a lot of innovation around what that concept could look like. And he came and presented in 2015 at a conference I curated and the translation that he was using with his accent, you know, came off as nightmare, which people were wondering, why is this man giving a speech for 20 minutes about <laughs> bringing nightmares to the city? And then we all realized nightmare. Okay. And then in m most of our cities, uh, the mayor themselves feel like, actually, I'm the mayor. I'm at the mayor during day. I'm the mayor during night. So we'll have a different nomenclature uh, for what this job is. But I don't want to be a nightmare. Not, no, that's not, that's <laughs> way beyond my abilities. But, um, you know, you're bringing up, Merrick brings up an interesting point because all of us are kind of in within municipal government. And I think I may be speaking in turn for my colleagues here, but a, an excellent model is to have one of us outside of city government that can pull all the food, beverage, entertainment together so that we can work hand in hand because there are things that we can't quite do inside city government that the outside of city government can do. So it's a real partnership that's required. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna mention the same thing that you know Merrick was not in city government. He was an advocate outside of it. And it's been fascinating to me to watch the development of this position because it really has tended to move into city government for for better or for worse is is where it tends to land. Um, um, and particularly in America, I think in Europe, it's a, there's a there's a little bit more of that sort of outside, separated from the government itself. But um, in this country, it really tends to to land, I think, primarily in in the city, um, which is a debate that we've had amongst ourselves <laughs> on and on about whether that's the right place for it to be. And I'm going to turn now to, to Brian Block from the city of Austin. And um, Brian, thanks so much for, for joining us. And I'm actually, you know, there's a really great question um, that came in that actually might be some, a good way to kind of frame your, your conversation a little bit coming in from, from Graham Smith-White here in D.C. And basically asking about the, the sort of notion of economic development for artists specifically and sort of, you know, hopefully the assumption is not that if the bar does good, the band does good, that they're sort of not competing interests, but they're complementary interests. I know in the city of Austin, you are juggling a lot of different pieces in terms of the nightlife coordination. And again, we're talking pre-COVID, post-COVID, like we, we can talk about right now as well. But in general, the sort of, you know, awareness that the music community has needs, the nightlife businesses have needs, sometimes, you know, there's a Venn diagram there somewhere, right? Could you talk a little bit about yes. yeah, Austin's attack and all that? Yeah. I think that's right. And, and, you know, Michael, maybe we're uniquely able to talk about that because my office comes out of, emerged from the music office. And so that connection with the music ecosystem is really present and has been something very consciously kind of thought about. Um, I guess... You know, one thing, I'll just respond to a couple of quick points that you all made. Um, you know, definitely in the US, um, you know, we see more kind of our role or our type of role in the local government, but I completely agree with Allison. We really need and want the community to be organized and our music community here in Austin is incredibly organized. So that works really, really well to have someone inside who can, you know, not necessarily be running things, but be supporting what the community is doing. But, and the other thing is this emerging discipline really isn't homogenous. I think there are three kind of key elements and this goes into how we were formed. So I'm kind of getting to a point eventually. But, you know, there's advocacy and kind of economic development. I think that's one strong thread. And then there's the kind of planning and management. Um, and, you know, each city is unique and has unique challenges and kind of has a unique sort of origin story of why a role like this was created. I think that's how it should be, right? It should respond to the needs, the real specific needs of the community. Um, 
And, and, you know, then we also have to deal with the peculiarities of local government, and we don't always get the structure we want right away. Um, you know, sometimes we have to wait for our moment, for our issue to be the issue of the day, nationally or locally. Um, you know, in um, Austin, and there, there's a lot of kind of hyperbole and sort of perceived arrogance with this, you know, the live music capital of the world, we get that. But, you know, what it does do is it kind of puts a stake in the ground and sort of says how important live music is to our community and our culture and our economy. So, you know, there is a lot of focus on it. And that's kind of the origin of my office. You know, back in kind of 2008 was the beginning discussions of having a music office. And it kind of gets to this same kind of discussion and not conflict, but sort of debate and dialogue because it was supposed to do two things. It was supposed to support the music ecosystem and the music industry, all sectors, right? It was supposed to be about advancing the music industry in Austin, but it also at the same time was trying to deal with compatibility issues, you know, between live music for sure and, and residential as sort of downtown got built out a lot more. And then, so it was created, our music office was created. We were created to do both of those things. Um, you know, my sort of role relates completely to the planning, the management, the regulation, the policy, the things that happen in the physical nighttime space, that sort of nighttime nightlife ecosystem. But, you know, what we learned very quickly was live music venues share the same ecosystem as the broader nightlife. And you can't really deal with one without the other. And we learned that very quickly. And as early as 2014, there was already the idea to kind of spin off and kind of keep one side focused on advocacy and economic development in the music industry. And to have the other side have to be more broadly about, you know, the nightlife space. And in 2017, that's when my role, you know, I was the first person in that role, at least still in the music office, focused on our issues of planning and management and policy. And then just this year, last year, actually, we kind of officially spun it off and it's in a different department where there's kind of better alignment to do this work. So I think both are really important. And if you can get it, you know, maybe every city can't get it right away, but maybe an aspirational goal is to do both things. Um, and I guess, you know, what one thing I would say, and maybe, and then I'll kind of end there, is regardless of whether we are sort of explicitly focused on advocacy and being a liaison or not, it's really part of all our work. It kind of um, unites us. I think it's one thread that goes through all of them because we kind of become the folks who really understand the business model and the operations and the regulatory environment and what they're dealing with, you know, and there's a lot of similarities there. Um, alcohol licensing, because as we know, music venues, most of those ticketing fees go to the band, you know, they're making their money on alcohol a lot, just like our nightlife businesses are. Um, so we all kind of end up understanding the model, understanding their operational realities and kind of being a liaison to the city for those stakeholders and kind of informing hopefully policy and regulation and, and, and making sure that that's done with full knowledge of kind of what their realities are. Well, and that's so great, Brian, and building off of what you, you said, again, something that is sort of in our DNA at, at Music Policy Forum is this notion that you know, within the next 10 to 15 years, if this field develops the way it should develop, every city is going to have a version of these sort of intentional 
whether it's strategy or however you want to frame it, it doesn't have to be like a, a, a you know a document document, but you know there's going to be intention around these sectors and and you know rooted in the heart of it is that everybody's totally different. So I mean, bringing in Sarah Spurlock, I mean Fort Lauderdale has got different needs than Austin, Texas. You know, so how does you know your role kind of work in Fort Lauderdale on the nighttime side? And you know, I'm sure you've got actually you and Austin maybe have more in common and and some of the nightlife stuff than I would have thought of, but. Um, but what is, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you approach the work in Fort Lauderdale. Sure. So I was um, hired in January of 2018. And my, my role, the reason I was hired is not to promote and encourage and advocate for a vibrant, exciting life at night, but to control it and regulate it. <laughs> so we had noise complaints. Um, that they wanted someone to be able to take the call at two in the morning to deal with. Uh, We had extended hours permits um, that needed to be approved and vetted and they needed someone to do that. So that was the the primary reason I was hired. And well, actually I think that was the only reason I was hired, but I saw the position as so much more than that because RHI had done a study in Fort Lauderdale as well and had produced a sociable city report as they have done in many cities. And my boss, the city manager, I work directly for the city manager, um, said, you know, read this. I'm like, okay. So, you know, as pioneers, that's one thing we've all been able to do is basically create a program from the ground up. And mm-hmm. I have literally done it from scratch uh, with nothing based on an entirely different premise than what I am now trying to do. So, you know, Brian really nailed it when he said we have to wait for our moment. Um, you know, for three years, I've been waiting for moments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I feel like what the, the value that I've been able to add is as a liaison and advocate for the hospitality industry, the cultural industry, the, the entertainment industry, who I feel that up until now have been the redheaded stepchild um, and have been sitting at the kids' table and not at the grown-ups' table. Mm-hmm. And my goal is to get them at the grown-ups' table, to get them a seat at the table so that the, the community and the policymakers see the value of that industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I am also uh, much, very much into planning. I don't think that a successful nighttime economy should just be a byproduct of daytime planning. Um, And traditionally governments work nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, So we're gonna build a bike lane that goes through the downtown area or runs along the beach or whatever. Okay, well, you also need to ride that bike at night. So that's great that you came up with a safe travels for a a biker at three o'clock in the afternoon. How is it at nine o'clock at night? Um, the, The shrubbery, the foliage that you have around a development. You don't think much about it during the day, but at night it could hide bad guys. Mm-hmm. You know, at, at night it, it, it inhibits your, your sight lines. So it, it's getting people to understand that there's another perspective that, you know, one of the first introductions I made to our mayor and commission um, was about doing a nighttime fiscal impact study. And they looked at me like I had three heads and the mayor said, we've got the beach, we've got sunshine. The nighttime's just gonna happen. Well, the nighttime doesn't just happen. Mm-hmm. It needs to be, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Michael, there needs to be deliberate and intentional planning. And that's what, what I am advocating for. And I, and I think that you know patience and, and waiting for your moment um, is really key because every community, as everyone has said, is very different in their needs. That's great, Sarah. I, I, I appreciate that perspective um, so much. And when we talk about, again, cities that have unique challenges, you know, by definition, New York is unique. And Jose, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, love to hear a little bit about your team. I mean, New York, you know, New York is, you know, everybody's was well, my favorite, right? I mean, so everybody loves New York, or at least I love New York. And we want it to thrive and, and it's just so complicated and confusing and fantastic and wild and weird and all the things together. And the idea of trying to kind of build 
a team to sort of engage in this work for nightlife just feels overwhelming to me. I mean, could you talk a little bit about kind of big picture, what the, the mission is and the vision and kind of how you're attacking this stuff? Sure. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, so as you said, we, we do have a team in New York. Um, I'm Jose. I'm the deputy director for the Office of Nightlife, which sits within the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Uh, we also have a senior executive director. Her name's Arielle Pallets. She apologized she can't be here today, um, but she's she sends her regards to, to all of you. Um, so yeah, we have a team of four um, within the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and that's an agency that also has in its portfolio film, and theater, music, and, and other entertainment industries. So we sit within that larger agency, somewhat like how Scott described um, where he sits within Seattle. And the Office of Nightlife was created um, about three years ago to address a wide range of challenges. Um, uh, about a year or two before that, there was um, this you know, grassroots movement and organizing movement uh, focusing on the repeal of this prohibition era anti-dancing law, which was known as the cabaret law. Um, and that was a, a largely successful movement. It, it um, was able to um, repeal the uh, requirement to obtain a permit to allow patron dancing, um, even though there are other parts of city zoning and building code that, that also uh, regulate or control what kinds of activity that you can have in your venues. Um, but that movement created this question, you know, what, what comes next? Um, so concurrently or, or uh, just after that, um, the, the city created an office in part to help, you know, unwind um, some of those older, more restrictive policies. Um, the, the mayor of New York City in the 90s, Rudy Giuliani, um, uh, had a, a famously uh, restrictive approach to nightlife and um, uh, a lot of the folks in the in the industry and the advocacy community um, were, were looking to um, have a, have a different approach, um, even though some of those policies, uh, you know, were still in place uh, almost a generation later. Um, so the the Office of Nightlife in New York was created to to think about you know an institute, a new and and more supportive approach. Um, so. In more or less the first year of our existence, we um, did a series of, um, you know, community engagements and town hall meetings and focus groups and um, economic research to kind of understand what we're working with um, and try to identify and assess some of the problems so that we can uh, identify systemic challenges in order to propose solutions. Um, so on the the research side, um, you know, we defined nightlife as broadly speaking, leisure and sociability after 6 p.m. Um, and that included food service, bars, live music performance venues, other types of recreation. And that comprised 25,000 establishments. So it's a big city of eight and a half million people. So you've got a lot of things you can do after 6 p.m. Um, and we found the industry supports about 300,000 jobs with $35 billion annual impact. So this was a very, very substantial part of, of the city's economy. Um, and on the sort of policy side, you know, we, we ended up kind of funneling um, all of the, the ideas that we wanted to tackle into four broad um, focus areas. So uh, First, supporting nightlife businesses, primarily through navigating city processes, um, but also ensuring that we were uh, working to improve quality of life um, to, to be able to, you know, ensure that there's, um, you know, harmonious um, existence between nightlife venues and, and neighbors in a dense, um, uh, crowded city. Um, also elevating nightlife culture, so making sure that we were you know, recognizing and respecting the cultural contributions of, of nightlife and, and really centering, um, you know, that part of the community in order to make sure that they are represented and they have a voice in city government. And then finally, um, promoting um, health and safety and harm reduction. So taking, um, you know, a harm reduction approach to 
um, substance use and, and thinking about consent awareness and sexual violence prevention, um, sort of, you know, undoing the, the historic view of, of nightlife as a liability and looking at it rather as an opportunity for people to look out for each other and for New Yorkers to, you know, treat each other uh, with with respect and, and fairness. And, you know, we, we find that that can, those movements can kind of come out of, of nightlife spaces. So functionally speaking, um, you know, how we've been accomplishing that, we established a dedicated interagency working group with the more than 15 city and state agencies that have some sort of either regulatory oversight or some uh, supportive relationship to the nightlife sector. Um, and we work with them regularly to review and revise policies and actually directly resolve constituent issues. So uh, businesses or patrons or residents can come to us, they'll contact us with some sort of challenge um, and we can connect them to the right um, services or work with our city agency partners to help re resolve those issues. Um, and so that's led us to actually in the next couple of weeks, um, we'll be uh, releasing a report of um, uh, about 25 different policy recommendations for um, you know, the, the next several years of how we can um, help bring nightlife back from you know, the devastation of the last year, but also address some of the challenges that were in place uh, even before the pandemic. That's great, Jose. I, I, I appreciate that. And it's, um, yeah, and, and, and again, in, in our program today, we're not going to dwell too much on um, the immediate impact of the pandemic. You know, I will note the study came out this week just documenting the unbelievable job losses for the creative creative workers in, in New York during the past period of time. And 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 again, these issues all, um, you know, kind of connect together in terms of, of not only relief aid, but also what's it going to look like to build back in different ways? What's the new normal going to look like? And it's just really complicated. We very much look forward to your report. Alex has put those links in the chat. Uh, I know everybody's interested in, in kind of following up on that. So before I, I ask my next question, I want to again encourage audience members, if you have questions for this group, um, you can either put them in the chat or in the Q&A window or raise your hand if you want to be brave and be on camera. Uh, we may try that today. We'll, we'll may not. We'll see how that goes. Um, we've got about 20 minutes, uh, you know, to kind of continue this conversation, which is, uh, again, I'm just so appreciative of everybody's time and energy today. I, I want to ask a question about um, expertise inside the public sector, and I'm going to throw this open for anybody who would like to speak to it. But one of the structural challenges I think facing the music community over time has been this sort of notion that um, Nighttime businesses, including venues, have really been drivers of economic development in neighborhoods and of really a lot of revitalization. And that's been exciting to a lot of cities because they they see the connection between, you know, getting the, the, the arts block going, you know, you get the venue, you get the restaurants, you get the whole thing. But then again, we get, you know, face these sort of ine inevitable cycles of economic development that then make it hard either for artists to survive in those neighborhoods or for those businesses to survive because the economics just spin out of control. And I'm, I'm curious if anyone has any insight into what does it mean to have embedded inside city government people who really understand those businesses and really understand the reality of how that works? Because I would argue that it's more unusual to see a public official out at you know 11:30 at a rock show, you know, than typical. I mean, mostly they're thinking about this theoretically because they don't really have the lived experience as much. I mean, obviously there are anomalies, but what does it mean for a city or a county to have someone who is a professional expert who knows the realities of that scene? How that informs broader policymaking about what's happening in the life of the city as it relates to the arts? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? I'll just take. I'll, I'll jump in just for like a really broad thing. I mean, I. I a lot of what we end up doing is being interpreters. You know, we, I interpret for city government the needs and the very peculiarities of each of these subsets of the broader sociability umbrella. And I also am a translator to um, music, the music community and restaurants about how to plug in and 
to understand the, say, the budget timelines of things or how you, um, how you advocate. You know, that's a whole new world to a lot of people that really has come to the fore with COVID. So we, in some ways, are interpreters and guides. And, and um, I, I don't want to go in. I, I know there are so many other people. I just thought I'd just throw that thought out there. I, I would follow up on that. And I totally agree. I think it's, it's, it also is just highlighting, spotlighting. Um, putting, as Sarah said about the the you know bushes at night, or what, what? How does that? How does how does that bike lane work? They don't. They don't. Just, they just don't think about the city after six p.m. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so being there to be a reminder to constantly. I mean, we had a we had a a, a fund that we were um, providing here. Um, from the city and uh, it wasn't available to businesses that served over 21 clientele. Um, and we, you know, I and, and my office pushed really hard to, to change that, to get the, the, the funding source different that we could, we could actually support these, these venues. So it really is just, it's, it's helping to, to, um, keep that spotlight on a sector that, that people just don't ever, it doesn't, it's not top of mind. It doesn't come to people. Instead and, um, of, you know, in, of that, oh, well, Joe, you go first. Yeah. And on top of the translation, like Allison is saying, it's also, um, you know, with that nighttime lens, these people that work in nightlife, they are intimidated by a suit and tie about going into a city office, about even anyone from the city coming into their business and, um, you know, trying to influence how they run their business. So we can take all that, uh, strip out the emotion of it, deliver it directly to the city in a very factual, uh, you know, laid out case for these businesses without um, all that cumbersome dialogue that might unfold in like a city council uh, public comment, you know. Um, So that's just another aspect of of how we deliver for uh, that message from those businesses to the city. That's all. Michael, uh, you know, I, I think that it really can't be overstated how important having that role is. Someone who understands, you know, the ecosystem and the business model, you know, as I talked about earlier, it's probably, I think, one of the most important things cities can do is this place to start from. Um, and, and kind of I'm going back to themes I talked about earlier, and I think that needs to be done from both an economic development perspective and advocacy perspective and planning and policy and regulatory. And you were kind of hinting at, you know, this is true for many of the cities. It's very much true for us. Affordability and displacement is a huge issue. It's probably the biggest issue we face because Folks can't afford downtown anymore in our entertainment areas. And, you know, new development is coming and actually physically displacing the buildings where they are. And so I think, you know, that's leading to a couple of trends. One is, you know, putting nightlife establishments inside new development or having city or public funding to help those kind of iconic and cultural places stay where they are, but it's also leading to folks moving further to outlying areas. And so we need to understand it from an economic development perspective and how do we help them, but also planning and policy of incompatibility related, we have to focus on that. If they're moving to other areas of the city, we have to help make that happen. Sarah talked about planning planning is essential when we're talking about a shift of where folks might be in the future. Well, and and just to to add to that quickly, Brian, and I said this earlier in a couple different configurations, but just, I I can't, from my perspective, stress this strongly enough that this work, whether it's, it's the particular sector that you're in or the particular perspective that you all are working in or the broader music advocacy work, it can never, it's never going to work if it comes from this sort of assumption that we have it figured out and we just have got to like get the team together. Like we all have to embrace the kind of mystery of like figuring this out together because this stuff is super complicated and it's interconnected in ways that we don't really understand, you know, and we think about 
like one of the, the the great things that Mark David, you know, my hero, but Music Venue Trust will talk about with a lot of the grassroots music venues in London uh, or in, in the UK that they work with is their use during the daytime. And how do you take nighttime establishments and connect them in with community groups? I mean, you know, we talk a lot in, in, in this conversation about the, you know, our excitement about the, the creative youth development field and just thinking about like, are there nighttime businesses that could be utilized during daytime hours by some of the CYD groups? Like, where is that happening or could that happen more? Like it's all relationships and drawing these connections. So it's just really, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, we've got some great questions coming in. So I'm, let's, let's bang through a couple of them. Um, I love this from Christopher Walker. Thank you, Christopher, for this question. Uh, does anyone have any advice on how to initiate the conversations with your city or county officials about starting nighttime cultural offices where they don't currently exist or have representation? So what, what do you tell folks if they're like, we want to get going on this, but like what's other, other than calling RHI? I guess that's part of the answer, but. <laughs> I would say, Michael, if, if there's a problem that you think you can solve with the nightlife program, that's a good, you, you need to show yep. your value. Yep. And solving problems is one way to, sh to show your value. So if you've got a real problem, um, you know, we have an entertainment district in town that has been particularly troublesome. Um, you know, having a nightlife office to address the trouble in this entertainment area, um, that's something that we can tackle. If you've got real issues with noise complaints, if you've got real issue with gun violence, um, I, I just think if there's a problem that you can solve, um, that is a great introduction. Mm -hmm. And I want to add that, you know, typically, you know, before I did this work, I was a consultant for RHI and an employee of RHI worked with, you know, dozens of city all over the country. And it always started from the problem. The one thing that COVID has been a silver lining is that now more than ever, people understand how valuable places to socialize or listen to music are and we can start from a value standpoint rather than it being a problem for the first time I think ever for nightlife it doesn't have to be the ugly stepchild anymore maybe um, so and I think the other thing that's valuable is to to use the life at night term mm -hmm. that it is not just about creating socializing for twenty year olds that it's about most of our cities because we are in a digital age, are working around the clock. And um, people don't just work to nine to five anymore. And those people who work on alternative life schedules deserve to have entertainment and socializing in their lives too. So um, I think when you think about life at night, there are all these different um, uh, jobs that are on different schedules and um, people can relate to that. So I think tapping into life at night in addition to nighttime economy. And, and Michael, if I can, just really quickly, I would say it's not just a conversation to have with your local government officials. You need to convince your stakeholders as well. Get your music venues to understand why you need, they need to have, um, to have this position. Um, <clears throat> because if you don't have the support of the, of the folks who you're helping, um, it's not gonna go very far. Yeah, I think that's those are all great, great responses. Um, and I, I love seeing Jocelyn Kane in the chat. And Jocelyn, we're so happy you're you're here with us. Um, and I'd also call out, you know, this stuff is is it 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 mushrooms organically, right? So Jocelyn, her work in the Bay Area is one of the first people in the country to do this type of work. And I think that cities and counties like to follow best practices. And if you can have stakeholders go to city or county officials and say, look, all these other cities are doing this. We can build off their work. You know, we can connect in with the, the things they're doing. Um, you know, that tends to kind of help advance this sort of stuff. So I also think it's helpful to identify at least one champion within city government itself. I, I, I fully agree with Scott. I think that organizing on the outside at the grassroots at the, at the broadest possible level is essential and I think, addition to that, you need at least one person, whether that's in the administration or the legislature, however your mm -hmm. municipality is, is organized, who's going to see the value and who's going to own the project and who's going to push it forward, hell or high water. So we've got two more great questions, and then that's probably going to bring us to time. So let's just, um, these are... 
you know, I'm mindful again that I'm going to try to get as many of you back in the show in a couple of months because this is a long conversation and it's kind of preposterous to try to cram this into an hour. Um, so I, I apologize for that exercise, but um, but let's let's bang through. Let's let's touch on these these two really important questions quickly. Um, you know, Bruce from Columbus asks uh, something we touched on a little bit, but let's dig a little bit deeper on the relationship between. You know, sort of how you sit in with dedicated entities that are really responsible for developing music business infrastructure and, and advancing musicians' careers. So again, some of you, Brian, I mean, you're already kind of incubated inside the office that's responsible for doing that. Scott, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that those pieces connect in Seattle and King County and kind of in that region. So it's, it's about um, the, the groups that are working sort on... Of, yeah, where, where does your piece as sort of an, uh, uh, an after dark advocate connect in to people who are working for the city or for the region around mu uh, music business infrastructure, advancing careers, more of that kind of piece? Sure. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, I think the primary thing here in Seattle is we have a Seattle Music Commission, um, and that's made up of industry professionals who, uh, who work, who advise the city on um, music uh, policy. So I work very closely with them um, and, and we look at needs in the city within the industry um, uh, to, to determine like how, how we would like to inform the city um, in, in creating policy. Um, we work very closely with King County, with our, with our structure, with you know, Kate Becker from, uh, who is also part of Music Policy Forum, um, uh, hand in glove with them. Uh, so it's, it really is, um, trying to, 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 to bring in a holistic, you know, all, it, I don't sit in a, in a, in a bubble, um, where I, I'm not, you know, if, if you don't, you're not out dealing with everybody in the ecosystem, um, uh, you're not going to be effective. And, and then, and I, and I will say in terms of grabbing the moment, as was said before, you know, COVID is the moment, um. It, it really is. And as Allison said, it's shined the spotlight on the importance of the industry and it's galvanized our industry here. And so I, I work very closely with our industry members um, and, and they are very interested now that they have this new political power uh, in, in what they're going to do moving forward. So um, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, I think that's good. And, you know, Bruce, obviously everyone's happy to kind of follow up with you offline on, on how some of those things are working in practice as they kind of think about the architecture. I know Bruce's uh, Columbus Music Commission is kind of quasi-governmental. They've got some public funding, but they sit outside government. And I'm not sure exactly how that all is connecting in with some of the nightlife stuff there. Um, we're going to wrap with this really provocative question from Deloge Smith that could take an, really should be like a standalone program. So <laughs> I'm sorry that we're going to kind of you know, spend just a few minutes on this topic, but but it's it's really uh, it, it's critical. So, how have your nightlife initiatives addressed issues of racial equity in your cities, especially economic opportunities for young people? So, how how when we, we talked earlier about the sort of interconnected notion of of where your work sits into kind of broader policy objectives inside government is is that something you've got any kind of tangible things you could share or, or reflect on that question? Does anybody want to just jump in? Brian, you are nodding a little bit. Or are you nodding because it's a good question or because you have something to say to that? I, I mean, I think I'll say a few comments. You know, I think for all of us and everyone, all cities around the country, equity is a huge issue. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is something that we talk about and focus on a lot. You know, all of our public funding goes through that kind of a lens now. Um, especially in arts and culture and music, um, and hopefully more so in the broader nightlife, nighttime economy space as well. Um, I'll let other, I know it's important for everyone. Does anybody else feel like they've got anything to say on that topic? I mean, right now, just doing a lot of work to amplify what's being done by other agencies, particularly during COVID, you know, um, we, we see that, you know, like say, say for the, the food business, the takeout, you know, a lot of the very small minority immigrant businesses may, um, 
not even be online. You know, they may not even have a website. So we have a really great program called Get Online, Grow Online, and that was created during COVID. And, we, you know, we're amplifying that. Um, we have a minority business list that was created in the city and we're, you know, really promoting that out too. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, I, I'm an office of me and another person. Yep. And you see all this work that we have yep. to do. It's built in, I would say the equity piece is being built into everything we do though. And, and, you know, suffice it to say that we're, we're building it in. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's great, Allison. And, and I think it, you know, these are obviously, um, you know, a lot of the last year in the music community has been not only dealing with the realities of COVID and the shutdown and, and the economic and public health crisis, but also the reckoning about we can't just get back to what the normal used to be. And then we've got to really reconceive what is, you know, what what do we want our music community to look like and, and what does equity look like in that context? And what does that mean in practice? You know, so it's one part to say, well, we want to do better, but it's like, what does doing better actually look like? And as I, as I keep saying, you know, everybody's inventing this as we go along because there's not like the plan and people just haven't done the plan. It's like, we're all trying to figure it out. So that's been, you know, uh, uh, you know, from my standpoint, you know, cities like Austin and Seattle, which again have been key drivers in our Reopen Every Venue Safely initiative, um, you know, pilot cities that have been working to kind of figure out what are all the different, you know, stakeholders that need to be at the table. I know the work that Allison and her colleagues are doing in Pittsburgh around trying to think about the ecosystem there. And it's just really exciting to see, again, we're all just kind of on the same team here. And what does that mean? And, and how do we even define that? So um, again, apologies for shoehorning massive. I mean, this obviously can and should be like a five-day conference instead of a one-hour conversation. But I hope that um, from the standpoint of view in the audience that you felt like you learned something today or, or got some light bulbs going off in terms of some ideas or some thoughts about what you're doing locally or what you could be doing locally. Um, you know, obviously we'll, um, all these folks, you know, their information is in the, um, in the chat or you can find them through Google in terms of learning more about the initiatives and what they're doing for their offices. Um, and, you know, the great thing about our community is that everybody's trying to lift each other up. So people are as accessible as they can be. And, and I know I'd be happy to kind of share ideas and strategies and things like that as, as people are trying to puzzle this through. So again, um, I want to uh, thank our guests. I want to thank, um, as always, Alex Dolvin for doing an amazing job keeping the production side of this going. Um, and of course, thank audience for sticking with us uh, again another week. We, again, really know that you have a lot to do with your time and it means a lot to us that you participate every week. Um, this uh, program is recorded and will be archived. It'll be on the Music Policy Forum website early next week. If you saw something that you enjoyed today or thought is useful, please feel free to share the link with your friends and colleagues or post on social. Um, we, again, uh, comments, questions, ideas, uh, constructive criticism, as long as it's nice, uh, please hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. And uh, we've uh, been planning out the next couple of weeks of programming, and we're really, really, really excited for it. Um, so we'll have our announcement out on Tuesday for next week's program. And with that, everybody have a safe and productive weekend and look forward to talking with you all soon. Thank you again. Thank you.